The morning of June 29, 2013 started off like any other night shift for Toys R Us employee Isaac Millette Lloyd. He arrived at the store in the town of Hamburg, New York, a few minutes before 4 a.m., and upon being let in by the assistant store manager, began to follow his usual routine. He walked his bike to the back of the store, dropped off his lunch in the break room, punched in on the time clock, and then headed to the loading area to see what merchandise had come in and needed to be taken out to the floor to be stocked. While stocking shelves may not sound very glamorous, for Isaac, working at Toys R Us was something of a childhood dream come true. He was a kid at heart, and for him, unboxing the truckloads of pallets was sort of like an endless Christmas morning. There were constant surprises, and always new and interesting things to see. Isaac also enjoyed the job because of who he worked with. There was a solid crew of people at the store, most of whom had known each other for a while now and got along well. Each of the employees had an area of the Toys R Us that they kind of unofficially claimed and looked after, and most nights, things ran like a well-oiled machine. Of course, they still managed to have fun, albeit mostly over their walkie-talkies, which they used to stay in contact since the store was so big. About two hours into his shift that morning, Isaac heard what sounded like an alarm coming from somewhere in the back of the store where he was working. Assuming it would quickly be dealt with, at first, he simply ignored it. However, after a couple of minutes, it started to get a bit more concerning. He pulled out his walkie-talkie and radioed to the other employees, asking if any of them knew what was going on. Within a couple of seconds, Isaac's longtime colleague, Cindy Barone, answered. She said she wasn't sure, but that she was probably the closest to the manager's office and she would check it out. Isaac started to go back to work, but his attention was jolted away again just moments later, when he heard something far more unsettling than any alarm. From the other side of the store came what was unmistakably the sounds of Cindy screaming. As Isaac would soon learn, the Toys R Us that he loved so much had just become the scene of a tragic crime. Worse still, he and his colleagues were about to find themselves at the very center of the investigation. One emergency. Help me help her, Toys R Us. Okay, what's going on? I don't know. He was shot. He was shot? I don't know. At Toys R Us? Is he inside? Yes. Is there anybody else there? Yes, I have two other guys with me. Oh, my God. Was he there with you? Oh, my God. Okay, what's going on there? Who, who's there with you? Two of the stockers. I'm a stocker, and we had a manager. He opened at 4 o'clock here on Morton Club. And where was the manager when this happened? He left to let somebody in. Okay. And then another guy just told me the toy store was open, and that's how one of the other doctors got in. Okay, is he alive? I don't know. Is he alive? The 911 call you just heard was placed by Cindy Barone at 5.47 a.m. on June 29, 2013, just moments after she walked into the manager's office of the Hamburg Toys R Us. Inside, Cindy was met with a horrifying scene. The store's 35-year-old assistant manager, Larry Wells Jr., was slumped over and unresponsive in his chair, the phone on the desk in front of him laying off the hook. It was immediately clear that this was no ordinary medical emergency, though. Larry was bleeding profusely from his chest. There was blood in various places around the office, including on the walls and chair, and there were even larger amounts pooling on the floor. Based on the information Cindy provided to dispatchers, Hamburg police were alerted that they might be dealing with one or more active shooters. As a result, paramedics were advised to stay outside while police worked to secure the building. In the meantime, all of the Toys R Us employees were evacuated, including Larry, who was dragged to safety by one of the responding officers. His breathing was incredibly shallow, and he'd lost a lot of blood, but he still had a faint pulse and was rushed to the hospital. Within minutes, the SWAT team also arrived at the scene. A thorough sweep of the Toys R Us was conducted, during which no shooters were found. The store was determined to be safe to enter, and Hamburg police were given the green light to begin analyzing the scene. Understandably, processing a crime scene the size of a Toys R Us store was a pretty massive undertaking. However, with the exception of the store's front doors, which looked like they had been damaged and might have been a possible point of entry for the perpetrator, detectives focused the bulk of their efforts on the manager's office where Larry was found. 
In particular, they were hoping that they might be able to recover DNA that could reveal who was responsible for the attack. Doorknobs and other surfaces were swabbed, blood evidence was collected, and anything else that looked to be of interest was bagged to be sent away for further analysis. Among these items, two stood out. A baseball cap and a digital video recorder box. The baseball cap was a 2007 University of Florida Gators hat and was found lying on the floor of the office. To police, it looked out of place, especially since all of the Toys R Us employees were supposed to be in their company uniforms at the time of the attack. The DVR box was a little more straightforward. It was clearly part of the store's security system and had been recording footage from the business's surveillance cameras. Or at least, it had been. At the time investigators found the box, its power cord had been ripped from the wall. Still, they were hopeful that the device might have recorded some valuable evidence before it was unplugged. One thing detectives did not find was any evidence that a shooting had taken place in the manager's office. There were no shell casings, bullet holes, or gunshot residue anywhere that they looked. Hamburg police were still mulling this over when they learned why neither they nor the SWAT team had found any signs of a gunman. Cindy Barone had been wrong about Larry's injuries. He had actually been stabbed multiple times, not shot. This news was quickly overshadowed by a second piece of information authorities received. Sadly, Larry Wells had died on his way to the hospital. The case they were now investigating was a murder. But who could have wanted Larry dead, and why? It was a question that would soon come to baffle detectives. Within an hour of sunrise on the morning of June 29th, rumors had already began to circulate in Hamburg and the surrounding area that something terrible had happened at the local Toys R Us. News crews quickly flocked to report on the tragedy, releasing what few details were immediately available to the public. Among those tuning in that morning was Larry Wells' cousin, Michelle Rizzo. She would later recall in interviews how she felt a pang of dread when she saw those early reports. It wasn't until half an hour later when she received a call from her uncle that she would learn that the person who had been killed was Larry. She couldn't believe what she was hearing, and she was far from alone. Next to sadness, disbelief was the primary emotion felt by many that day, as family members, friends, and everyone else that knew Larry struggled to come to terms with his murder. As one person pointed out, quote, things like that don't happen to people like Larry. He was a kind and quiet soul. To die violently was the antithesis of what he was like. Now, I know that it's something of a cliché within true crime to paint an overly rosy picture of a victim's life, but in this case, it really does seem like Larry Wells was on the right path in life. A local journalist who covered the case, Matt Chandler, would later remark that in the 20 years of his career, he had, quote, "...never written about anyone who was so universally loved." Larry was born in the city of Dunkirk, New York in September of 1977. He was athletic from an early age and became interested in most of the big mainstream sports that was especially good at football. He ended up playing for his high school team at Pine Valley Central, where he was known as an accomplished running back. High school was also where he would meet his future wife, Jill Lucas. The high school sweethearts both attended SUNY at Fredonia, where Larry received a bachelor's degree in elementary education. He would go on to earn his master's degree in 2004, the same year he and Jill got married. After settling down in the village of Blaisdell, Larry started working as an elementary school teacher, mostly on a temporary basis. It was a job that he was passionate about and which clearly left an impression on those he taught. Years later, one former student remembered how Larry always tried to bring fun into her fourth grade classroom recalling fondly how he would sometimes make forts out of books with them in class. Unfortunately, due to budget cuts in many local school districts, Larry had found it hard to find permanent teaching positions. That's when he applied to Toys R Us. The job started out as a supplement to his teaching career, but pretty soon Larry began to impress those above him. Eventually, he had been promoted to assistant store manager. By all accounts, Larry brought the same fun-loving energy he had to teaching into his role as a manager, 
making him extremely popular with the people who worked for him. He wasn't the kind of boss who would sit in his office all day. When deliveries came in, he was right out on the floor with everyone else, unloading boxes, stocking shelves, and making conversation. Next to his wife, Jill, there was one other person that Larry cared for more than anyone else, his four-year-old daughter, Madison. According to those that knew him, Madison was the center of Larry's world. He would spend every bit of free time he had with her, with the two especially enjoying trips to local parks together or heading out to get pizza. Understandably, it was Jill and Madison who were hit the hardest of all by Larry's death. There was one other gut-wrenching layer of tragedy to the situation, though. Just three months before the murder, Jill had found out that she was pregnant with another little girl. Not just one, but two of Larry's children were now going to grow up without their father. As family members, friends, and co-workers of Larry Wells began to gather in the parking lot of the Toys R Us where he worked that fateful June morning, it became obvious to detectives just how beloved he was. Even so, it didn't take long for them to wonder whether someone within their midst might be the person responsible for the brutal crime. At the same time that the forensics team was processing the scene for evidence, other Hamburg Police Department detectives began constructing a timeline of the murder. It turned out that there were four people in the Toys R Us store other than Larry Wells at the time of the crime, and the first order of business was interviewing all of them. Authorities then combined all of their stories, putting together a rough outline of the morning's events. The morning began at around 3.55, when Larry Wells arrived at the store just a few minutes before the first delivery truck was scheduled to pull up at the building's loading dock. Like many big box retailers, the Hamburg Toys R Us received most of its merchandise overnight, since it was far easier to unload pallets and stock shelves when the store wasn't full of customers. At the same time that Larry went inside, he let in Cindy Barone and Isaac Mollette Lloyd both of whom were already waiting out front. Larry then made his way to the receiving area, letting in the delivery driver when he arrived before beginning to deal with that morning's load. As previously mentioned, Isaac walked his bike to the back of the store, making a quick trip to the break room to drop off his lunch before punching in. He then began working in one of the main toy sections of the store. Cindy followed a similar process, as one of the more experienced employees, though, as soon as the new merchandise arrived, she began working directly from pallets, beginning one section over from Isaac. Things continued like this until 4.53 a.m., when the next employee, Anthony Armstrong, arrived. When he did, he radioed at the front for Larry to let him in. This was one of the more tedious, albeit understandable, parts of Larry's job. Any time a colleague arrived during the night shift, he needed to walk the length of the store and use his key to let them in. After that, Larry would lock the door behind them. Anthony was the youngest and least experienced member of the team, and as a result, would often look to Larry for instruction on what to do. Larry set Anthony up with a couple of tasks before heading over to his office. The final employee to arrive that morning was Richard Shepard whose information would prove to be the most crucial in constructing the timeline. Richard told detectives that he was running late that morning and had arrived at 5 a.m., seven minutes after Anthony. However, when he radioed for Larry at the front door, he received no response. After a couple of minutes, Richard noticed that the front door to Babies R Us, which was connected to the Toys R Us, had been left unlocked. He thought this was extremely unusual, but not wanting to draw attention to himself because he was already late, he hurried inside and simply got to work. 47 minutes later, Cindy Barone would place her 911 call. Based on this information, detectives theorized that the attack on Larry Wells happened sometime between 4.53 a.m. and 5 a.m., right in the middle of Anthony and Richard arriving at the store. There was one other thing that police noticed from Richard's statement, though. Something that had pretty dark implications. If Richard was telling the truth, and the door to Babies R Us was unlocked when he arrived, it meant that the person who had killed Larry might not have entered through the front doors after all. In fact, they almost certainly had a key to the store. 
it was beginning to look like the murder of Larry Wells was an inside job. That being said, investigators still had no idea who would do this or why. Fortunately, there was already someone there who could lend a hand. As detectives were questioning the employees who had been working with Larry at the time of the murder, they were informed that there was someone at the scene who might be able to help with the investigation. It was the regional loss prevention manager for Toys R Us, Bernie Grusha. Bernie was among those who had come to the scene after hearing about the tragedy, and police found him out in the parking lot speaking with and attempting to console some of his co-workers. Bernie told authorities that he had driven to the Hamburg Toys R Us after receiving a call from company executives who informed him that someone had been killed at one of his stores. It was only after arriving, Bernie said, that he realized the victim was his friend, Larry Wells. Luckily for police, because of his role in loss prevention, Bernie was in a real position to help them out, and his expertise quickly came in handy. With his knowledge and assistance, they were able to start rapidly combing through the surveillance footage on the DVR box they had recovered from the manager's office. The video led to some important and disturbing new discoveries. These discoveries all centered around an unknown person who had been captured entering the Hamburg Toys R Us at 4.24 a.m. Just as detectives had suspected, the video showed that this person had gained access through the Baby's R Us entrance with a key. The damage to the other main door had evidently been the suspect's attempt to cover their tracks. Once inside, the suspect began walking through the building methodically and carefully, zigzagging through various areas and at times ducking behind shelves and aisles. At 4.32 a.m., the suspect made their way to the front of the store and along the front wall into the manager's office, closing the door behind them. Seven minutes later, at 4.39 a.m., the footage stopped. This is obviously when the DVR box's power cord had been unplugged. Based on the timeline detectives already had, they knew that Larry had gone into the office about 15 minutes later. It now appeared that when he entered, the suspect had been lying in wait. Unfortunately, the surveillance camera footage was too grainy to make out many identifying features of the unknown person. On top of this, they had clearly been wearing a disguise. From the looks of it, a mask, a scarf, and a hat. That being said, the video was clear enough to discern a couple of important things. The hat the suspect was wearing was the same Florida Gators baseball cap police had found on the floor of the manager's office. Based on the video, it also appeared that the person had a fairly distinctive walk. Lastly, and most alarmingly, as the suspect had walked the aisles of the Toys R Us that morning, they had been holding a large kitchen knife, one that looked to have about an eight inch long blade. After seeing all of this, investigators became even more convinced of their inside job theory of the case. Whoever the perpetrator was, their movements through the store suggested that they had an intimate knowledge of the Hamburg Toys R Us's layout, as well as its security weak points. With that, detectives decided it was time to take a closer look at Larry Wells' co-workers. Now firmly believing that their killer had to be someone with inside knowledge of Toys R Us, Detectives with the Hamburg Police Department started pursuing any leads they could find connected to this theory. They began with the four employees who had worked the night shift with Larry Wells, soon finding reasons for each one that they felt made them suspicious. During Isaac's interview, detectives noticed that he seemed incredibly nervous and on edge. This obviously could have been because of the terrible thing that had just happened, or police speculated that he could have something to hide. Cindy was automatically considered a person of interest because she was the one who had found Larry. As previously mentioned, she was also one of the more experienced employees, meaning that she would have been the most familiar with the store's layout and security. Anthony got the attention of detectives because he was by far the most uncooperative of the four employees and didn't want to speak to them at all. And then there was Richard, 
who had given police the valuable information about finding the door to the Baby's R Us unlocked when arriving for work. Richard stated that he had been late for work that morning because he had stopped off at a local grocery store to pick up some items for his lunch. However, investigators considered the possibility that this might be a smokescreen to throw them off. Maybe there was a more sinister reason for Richard showing up late, and he had tried to feed them information to make himself look less suspicious. All this being said, detectives didn't limit themselves to investigating the four night shift employees. Dozens of past and current employees of the Hamburg Toys R Us were interviewed, with police probing whether any of them might have had a reason to want Larry Wells dead. Perhaps Larry had fired someone, or else had been involved in something that had otherwise caused someone to hold a grudge against him. Just like before, though, no one had anything bad to say about Larry. In the meantime, Hamburg police released images taken from the Toys R Us surveillance system, hoping that someone out there might be able to identify their suspect. Unfortunately, there was no such luck. Then, several days into the investigation, detectives received word of a major development. The county crime lab had processed the evidence they sent over and had recovered usable DNA from both the Florida Gators hat and the power cord of the DVR box in the manager's office. Both samples belonged to the same unknown male. They now had the DNA of the person who had killed Larry Wells. The unknown male genetic profile did not return any matches in the CODIS database. However, detectives were confident that they would be able to find a match amongst those that they had already questioned. The FBI was brought in to assist and help to collect DNA samples from 47 different past and current employees of Toys R Us, including all four who were present at the time of the murder. The samples took some time to analyze, but within a few weeks, detectives had their results. To their shock, no one was a match. With that, they were back to square one. Over the following weeks, investigators tried to chase down any new lead they could find. They canvassed the neighborhood around the Toys R Us, re-interviewed witnesses, and did whatever they could to keep the case alive. A couple of times, they were able to uncover promising new information. One witness told them about a black Chevy Impala they had seen in the parking lot of the Toys R Us at around 1 o'clock on the morning of the murder. This was noteworthy because the vehicle did not belong to Larry or any of the other employees that had been working the night shift. Unfortunately, the witness had not obtained the license plate information of the suspicious car. Another frustrating close call came when detectives once again reached out to the FBI for assistance, who helped them to develop a possible profile of their suspect. With this, Hamburg police zeroed in on a man named Patrick Walden. Patrick had recently been released from jail and shortly after had been arrested in a neighboring town. The incident caught the attention of investigators when they learned that the vehicle Patrick was driving at the time he was taken into custody was registered to an employee of Toys R Us. It turned out that Patrick's girlfriend's mother worked for the company. That wasn't all, though. When arresting officers performed a search of the vehicle, they found a large knife inside. Detectives began conducting surveillance on Patrick after learning all of this, and as a result were able to collect a cigarette butt that he threw out of his car window while driving. This was tested, but once again, it was not a match to their unknown suspect. As more weeks began to pass and updates in the investigation became fewer and farther between, many residents of Hamburg and the surrounding community remained on edge. They worried that someone was going to get away with murder. This feeling was even more intense amongst Larry's former co-workers, many of whom had since returned to their jobs when the Hamburg Toys R Us opened back up. For some, though, like Isaac, the reminder of Larry's brutal murder and the unanswered questions surrounding it proved to be too much. He ended up quitting shortly afterwards. Understandably, by this point, pressure was starting to mount on Hamburg police to solve the case. It was during this time, while combing back through everything, that they realized something they had missed. There was still one person whose DNA that they had yet to collect and test.
as previously mentioned, when detectives with the Hamburg Police Department were collecting DNA samples to match against the evidence they recovered from the crime scene, they focused on current and former employees of the Hamburg Toys R Us. They ended up testing 47 samples, but when they looked back at their records nearly two months later, they realized that there was someone who had been overlooked. It was the regional loss prevention manager, Bernie Grusha. Yes, the same Bernie Grusha who had been detectives' go-to guy at the beginning of the investigation, and who had come to the scene just hours after Larry's murder under the guise of consoling his traumatized co-workers. Strictly speaking, Bernie had been asked to provide a DNA sample, but so far he had come up with a bunch of reasons not to, and since he technically wasn't an in-store employee, up until now he had managed to fall through the cracks. When authorities realized this, they became far more insistent, and on August 14th, they finally obtained a sample. When it was analyzed, it came back as a match both to the DNA found in the Florida Gators hat and the DNA found on the DVR power cord. On October 17th, 2013, detectives interviewed Bernie at his home, where they confronted him with their new evidence. At first, Bernie tried to say that he wasn't surprised that his DNA was found at the scene. After all, he said, he regularly worked with the surveillance equipment at the Hamburg Toys R Us. The only thing that disabled that DVR from recording further was right. the power cord was pulled. Do you know whose DNA was found on that end of the power cord? Whose? Mine? Her. Yes. Well, I'm not surprised. I mean, I work with it. When Bernie was asked about the Florida Gators hat, though, he immediately became defensive. It was clear that he had no good explanation for his DNA being inside it, but despite this, continued to deny any wrongdoing. But, do you know whose DNA was found on the hat? I you saw the hat that morning. You weren't in there. That's what I said. The hat wasn't there. Whatever, guys. Your DNA's so on the hat. Great. It's I didn't do it. It's not great. Because the only way you got it I don't know there how it could be. because you had it on when you were there in the office. I don't know what you, I would I didn't do it. There's just no way. I understand what you're saying. I did not do it. As bad as whatever you guys have looks or whatever, I didn't do it. We're past the point about who did it. We know who did it. The question is why. You were there. You were in the office with him. This is crazy. I got to get my dog to the appointment at 10 o'clock. But your dogs can wait. I'm not taking the dogs to that party. I have nothing else to say. I didn't do this. So I need to say I want a lawyer, and that's going to shut you guys up. I'm not talking anymore. I want a lawyer. I'm done. I'm not talking anymore. As you just heard, the interview continued to grow more combative between Bernie and police until he said that he was done talking and needed to leave. By that point, it was already too late, though. Detectives were confident that they had enough to place him under arrest. Now, you might be wondering, wait, what about a motive? Weren't Bernie and Larry supposed to be friends? Why would he commit such a brutal murder? Well, detectives were asking themselves the same questions. That was, until they got a warrant to search Bernie's house. That's where they found all of the pieces of the puzzle they had been missing. From the outside looking in, it appeared that Bernie Grusha was living the American dream. And for a time, at least, this had been true. In the early 2000s, Bernie was doing incredibly well for himself. He was making enough money not only to support his wife Heather and their three kids, but also to fund a lavish lifestyle for him and his family. The Grushas lived in a nearly 4,000 square foot home complete with high-end furnishings, and their backyard in-ground pool was a summer hangout amongst the neighborhood kids. They owned multiple vehicles, including a late model Cadillac, and still had money left over to purchase several rental properties. Like many people, though, Bernie was hit hard by the 2008 financial crisis. He managed to scrape by for a while, but when his wife Heather was also diagnosed with cancer the same year, things started to slip away. Medical bills began piling up, and by 2009 he had declared bankruptcy. Unfortunately, this was only the beginning of the downward spiral. You see, despite his financial difficulties, Bernie did not change his spending habits. The situation got worse and worse until by 2013, he was at least $1.2 million in debt. 
Instead of trying to scale things back or fix things legally, however, Bernie came up with a desperate way to try and save face and hide everything instead. Using his knowledge and position as a loss prevention manager, Bernie began stealing from the various Toys R Us stores he was in charge of overseeing. Sometimes he would take straight up cash, but for the most part he preferred to steal high-priced electronics. Detectives discovered this during the search of Bernie's house, where they found thousands of dollars worth of Toys R Us merchandise crammed into the garage. Bernie had been using it as his makeshift black market warehouse, and then selling the items through an eBay account he owned. It was estimated that in total, he had ripped off Toys R Us to the tune of more than $200,000. Even so, by June of 2013, Bernie was growing increasingly desperate. In addition to the whole scheme he was running, his marriage had now fallen apart and he was going through a divorce. Police were called to the house on at least three separate occasions for domestic incidents during this time. The last of these, which occurred exactly three weeks before the murder, provides unsettling insight into Bernie's state of mind at the time. In the early morning hours of June 8th, police were called to the Grusha home after a gunshot rang out at their property. It turned out that during a fight with Heather, Bernie had run upstairs into their bedroom and fired the gun, then laid down on the floor to make it look like he was dead. When Heather ran into the room, terrified to see if he was okay, Bernie reportedly got up and said, quote, I just wanted to see if you still loved me. When police arrived that morning, they discovered that Bernie had obtained the gun illegally and he was charged for criminal possession of a weapon and also removed from the family home. Even after all of this, Bernie had continued on with his Toys R Us scheme, leading to the tragic events of June 29th. Based on evidence found during the search of his residence, detectives learned that the day before, he had rented a black Chevy Impala, the same one that the witness said they had seen in the parking lot roughly four hours before the murder. As the final icing on the cake, so to speak, they found a video clip on an SD card at the house that showed Bernie walking with the same recognizable gait as the suspect in the Toys R Us surveillance footage. Even though authorities had plenty of evidence against Bernie Grusha, they worried about taking the case to court. They had never managed to recover a murder weapon, and they were also concerned about a recent legal decision at the time involving a case where a victim had been stabbed multiple times, but the decision was overturned on appeal on the grounds that this wasn't proof enough of intent to commit murder. As a result, the DA's office spoke to Larry's family and told them that offering Bernie a plea deal for manslaughter was more likely to result in a solid conviction. Larry's loved ones begrudgingly agreed, and Bernie Grusha agreed to plead guilty to manslaughter. Perhaps the one good thing to come of this arrangement was that Bernie had to admit to killing Larry Wells, and also provided the remaining missing details about what had happened that fateful morning. He said that he had driven to the Toys R Us in his rental car, cased the place for several hours, then had entered and done his best to avoid surveillance cameras. He had gone into the manager's office and waited for Larry, ambushing him when he entered to try and force him to open up the store safe. Larry wasn't going to let that happen, though, and as a result, Bernie had stabbed him to death. He fled the scene empty-handed immediately afterwards, completely unaware that he had left behind his hat. Following his guilty plea, Bernie Grusha was given the maximum sentence for his manslaughter conviction of 25 years in prison. He will have to serve a minimum of 22 and a half of those years, meaning that his earliest possible release date will be in 2035. So I'm just going to say right off the bat that uh, this was one of the toughest stories I've ever covered on this channel. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that I'm really close to the age Larry was when he died, and I probably just relate to him a lot for that reason. Though, I mean, the story itself is excruciatingly sad in every possible way. When I heard the statement his wife Jill gave for the first time at his sentencing, I'll be honest, it wrecked me emotionally. I can't even begin to imagine what she and the rest of Larry's family went through or have continued to go through since his death. One of the most heartbreaking aspects of this case, of course, 
is that Larry never got to meet his youngest daughter. However, as one of his final acts as a father, he was able to give her her name, Peyton. According to Jill, it was a name Larry had chosen shortly before his death. I want to end off with an excerpt from the statement that Jill made at Bernie Grusha's sentencing, because I think more than anything it gets across the profound loss at the heart of this whole tragedy. Quote, We were supposed to grow old together, raise our children together, watch them grow up, but instead, he was taken from us. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, thanks so much everyone, and take care.